Alright, we are in Revelation the 15th chapter and we're going to do our best to finish this chapter. And believe, here's what's amazing. We're going to finish this chapter in three lessons. Wow. Okay, that's unbelievable. I mean, it's only eight verses, so we ought to be able to finish it, but a uh, uh, pretty interesting chapter. Um, get out your Bibles, and let's just turn to Revelation 15 for just a second. And what did, at the very opening of the chapter, what did John see? What did he see? Okay, he saw a sign. Okay. It was great and marvelous, but what was the sign? Seven angels having seven plagues, right? And then all of a sudden, he changes the subject, doesn't he? Okay? And all of a sudden, he sees a sea of glass. And there are individuals standing upon that glass. Who are those individuals? They are the redeemed, aren't they? Okay, folks, think about this. God is about to pour out His plagues of wrath. Okay? But what does He do with His redeemed? He brings them in close, doesn't He? He brings them in to encircle His throne, and now He can pour forth His plagues, and His people are what? His people are safe, His people are protected, and they will not suffer the plagues of the wrath of God. What a beautiful picture that is. Okay? Well, when the redeemed have this happen to them, they don't just stand there doing nothing. Okay? What do they do? Okay, yes. They start singing and they start praising the Almighty God, don't they? And it's a beautiful song that they sing, the Bible says, beginning at verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of kings. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Man. I wish the church praised God like that, don't you? Uh, unbelievable words that were spoken. I wanted to read the whole section in context because we're almost through with this particular section of the praise of these saints. And we're going to come back to a, uh, a point that we'll make right at the end. Notice he says in verse 4, uh, we were at the very last of verse 4, he says this, For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are what? are made manifest. Wow. Who do men have a tendency to bow the knee to? No. Yeah. Folks, usually, whoever is in a position of power, whoever is in a position of authority among men, that is who men gravitate toward, do they not? And they bow the knee to the individual or the power that is in authority. Okay? Uh, who has been in authority and in power, at least it seems like, in the book of Revelation up until this point in time? The dragon and the two beasts. The land beast and the sea beast. Okay? These are the ones who are in power. Rome and Judaism are the two beasts that have been in power. Well, guess what's going to happen to these powers? They're about to be what? They're about to be destroyed. God's judgments are about to be what? Manifested, the Bible says. And folks, that means there's going to be a radical change in what? A radical change in power. All these individuals who used to bow to the knee of Judaism, all these individuals who used to celebrate Rome and all of its glory, guess what they're going to do? They're going to quit. They're going to quit. When they're no longer the powerful ones, when they're no longer the strong ones, when they're no longer the ones who can give out uh, blessings and give out uh, benefits, then guess what? It's over. Okay? After these plagues are sent forth upon the earth, God says this, and all nations shall do what? 
Come and worship before Him. Okay? Folks, power is going to change. Okay? Once Judaism was destroyed, could Christianity shine in all of its glory? Oh, yes. Prior to AD 70, Christian, Christianity and Judaism in the minds of many people were locked hand in hand. J Christianity was looked at as just another sect of Judaism. Okay? Because where did Christianity come from? Yeah, it sprang from Judaism, didn't it? And, and, and it was uh, designed to do that. But it was also designed to come to an end, wasn't it? But just think, uh, here, here the first gospel sermon is preached in Acts 2. Jesus has died on the cross of Calvary. And guess what the Jews are still doing? The Jews are still in all of their splendor, in all of their glory. They're still going to the temple. The temple is still there. There's all the rites, all the rituals connected with Judaism. Judaism still looks like a vibrant religion, doesn't it? So how are we going to make this distinction? How are we going to enable Christianity to shine in its glory? Do away with what? Do away with Judaism. And folks, AD 70 did away with Judaism. Okay, for the most part. Why do we say that? Yeah. Temple was completely destroyed. Folks, the temple exhibited the presence of God, didn't it? Okay, and it was the place of worship. It's gone. Okay, it, if there's no temple, then there could be no sacrifices. See, the, the, whole, the whole worship system of Judaism, when the temple was taken away, was done away. What else was destroyed? All the records, all the records of what? Um, uh, yes. All the genealogies. See, they house the genealogies where? In the temple. You take away all the genealogies, you can't prove from what tribe you come from anymore, and therefore what's that going to destroy? That's going to destroy the priesthood. In order to have a priesthood, you had to come from the tribe of Levi. You can't prove that anymore. So now, there is no what? There is no priesthood. There is no high priest anymore after the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And the city itself is completely annihilated, is it not? It has taken a big hit. So, uh, uh, once all that transpired, now all nations could turn their attention to whom? To Christianity. Okay, and would be much more subject to uh, um, accepting Christianity and for uh, you know submitting to the demands of Christianity. So uh, very very interesting. Another individual made this statement. I thought it was interesting too. Once the enemies were overcome, it would be much easier for the gospel to be preached. Is that true? Oh yes, as long as you're under persecution, as long as you're under tyranny, as long as you're under uh, you know, distress, it makes it very difficult to preach and teach. And you know, individuals start looking around, they start thinking, you know, if I become a Christian, look what's going to happen to me. Or there's some bad things that had been done to Christians that we've read about in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Folks, if you didn't wear the number of the beast, you couldn't do what? You couldn't buy or sell. Think about that. Where are you going to get your food for your family? Where are you going to get money to pay the bills? Okay, you can't buy or sell. And they did a, a lot of persecution. Have we read about martyrs and individuals who are going to be killed for the cause of Christ in this book? Absolutely. Well now, guess what? The enemy is gone. Well, let me ask you this. Do things like that cause individuals to draw back from Christianity? Oh, I can't wait to be a Christian so I can get killed. <laughs> Who would think like that? You know, your next door neighbor's a Christian. He's come over to your house this morning. You've been talking to him about becoming a Christian, but he just came over to your house this morning in order to borrow some bread to feed his kids because he can't what? He can't buy or sell. Oh yeah, I think I'll be a Christian. So I can have to go beg food from my neighbor. Nobody wants to become a Christian. Well, folks, once the enemy is destroyed, all those restrictions are gone. And guess what now? People are more open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 
And faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Folks, if there's anything you and I need to constantly be praying for, it is P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. When there is war, when there is tribulation, when there is anguish, when there is strife in nations, guess what? The gospel has a difficult time making its way through a nation. Can you imagine trying to be a missionary over in Ukraine right now? Wouldn't that be tough? You finally get up the courage to go outside. You're going to knock on some doors. You step outside. First thing you hear is a what? You hear bombs going off. You hear warning signals going off. And everybody runs back into their house. You're not going to do mission work in that kind of a thing. Not, not as successfully as you would if there were peace and tranquility in the nation. So uh, very, very interesting. Now, let me read you this statement from Brother Wallace. And this is uh, why I read the entirety of that song of praise that these individuals have given to the Almighty God. He makes this statement. The song is a combination of many triumphant expressions of Old Testament psalmody, of praise and adoration pertaining to Israel's deliverance from enemy nations and Lord of domina domination. And again represents a parallel of apocalypses of the Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church. So in other words, here's what he's saying. You can take that little song, two or three verses that these individuals have used in praise to God. And you can go back into the Old Testament, and when God's people in the Old Testament are being delivered from their enemies, they're singing almost exactly the same phrases. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? And it'd be fun sometime just to go back and take those different phrases and look them up where they're used in the Old Testament because they just brought about six or seven together and put them all together in this one song of praise to God on this particular occasion. So uh, very, very interesting. Questions, comments, anybody? <clears throat> yes. Oh, yes. Much more difficult. Yeah, any, any struggles, any trials, any tribulations uh, that exist can uh, really cause some problems. Okay? Now, I want you to look at that last phrase of, of, of that song that they sang. Okay? They say this, For thy what? Judgments are what? Made manifest. Folks, when God finally judges the evil ones. Guess who shines? The righteous and God Almighty. Guess who's in control, folks? It's not puny little man. It's not some little despot somewhere. It's not some dictator of a nation. God is in control. And you understand that when you see God's judgments manifested. God foretells in Revelation eventually what came to pass. The Roman armies marched on the city of Jerusalem. The Christians fled from the city and did not suffer death. The Jews suffered tremendous hardship during the war. The walls of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. And guess who shined after that war? God did. I wrote this statement. God's judgments have been made manifest for all to see in times past. Mankind saw the rain that God promised to flood the earth. Mankind saw the fire and brimstone that fell from heaven upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mankind saw the ten plagues that overthrew the Pharaoh of Egypt. Mankind saw the ten tribes carried into Assyria. Mankind saw the nation of Judah taken away into Babylonian captivity. One day, man will see the Lord coming in all of His glory with all His holy angels with Him, bringing a fiery destruction upon the earth. Watch this though. Sadly, when the judgments of God are manifest then, it's too late at that point. 
for man to repent. Folks, we better thank God we are on this side of final judgment. You know that? Because right now, we can look back at all the judgments that God has rained down upon the earth and we can do what? Make corrections in our life. I can repent and I can get faithful. Folks, if that final judgment comes, there is absolutely nothing you'll be able to do to change your eternal destination. If there's something you need to do, guess what? Get her done. <laughs> get her done. Wow. So John sees this beautiful picture of the redeemed. And now, notice what happens in verse 5. And after that, I what? I looked. Uh-oh. He's about to what? He's about to see another vision. You know, if I were John, I'd just, I'd just keep looking straight ahead. Because every time I turn my head, guess what happens? I see something else. Oh, man. I, I know the old boy was worn out when he got through with these 21 chapters of Revelation, don't you? Oh, man, I've seen, you know, you're talking about a picture show. This is a picture show, okay? And after that I looked, and behold, listen to this description. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Now that is a weird description, is it not? The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. Uh, usually we read about the tabernacle, right? Or we read about the temple, but we never read about the two being what? Put together. The temple or the tabernacle of the temple. What in the world is he talking about? The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony. Anybody have a clue? Jim? Okay. When you go and study this, most individuals believe that what John saw, it was in heaven, it wasn't on the earth. And guess what he sees? He sees a tabernacle. Okay, folks, what was the tabernacle? Okay. Yeah, but it, 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 it was the place of God, was it not? Okay? It, it just wasn't a permanent structure like the temple. Okay? And even the temple was never intended to be a permanent structure, was it? It was intended to be done away with. Uh, but it was a place of worship. It was a place that housed the very presence of God. Now John turns and what does he see? He sees the temple of the tabernacle. Where did God dwell in that tabernacle? the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, right? There was a holy place. You'd enter into that uh, tabernacle. There was a holy place. And you would look in front of you and what would you see? Yeah, you'd see a beautiful curtain that separated this room from another room. And behind that was what? Was what? There was the ark of God. Upon that ark rested what? The mercy seat, right? The mercy seat. And housed within that ark was what? The Ten Commandments. The testimony of God. And folks, the old law is referred to as God's testimony. Okay? God's testaments to man. God's revelation to mankind. What's John see? John looks up into the heavens. He sees the tabernacle. He sees into the tabernacle. And he sees what? 
He sees the temple, the dwelling place of God. And what happens? All of a sudden, that curtain moves back and that tabernacle is opened up. And there's a reason for that. Because something is about to burst forth from that realm. And guess what it is? Seven angels of God. Okay? The seven angels of God. Exodus 25, 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. Isaiah 8 and verse 20 says this, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The old law was referred to as what? The testimony. How many things were housed in the... Ark of the Covenant. Does anybody remember? Okay. okay, number one, there was the manna, right? An omer, a pot of manna that was put in there. The second thing was Aaron's rod that budded, proving that he was the ultimate authority as far as religious authority in the nation of Israel. And the third thing was what? The Ten Commandments. And folks, those Ten Commandments represented what? The totality of the law of God. Okay, you look upon those Ten Commandments and guess what? You didn't think just Ten Commandments. You know, we're obsessed with the Ten Commandments for some reason in our society. Okay, folks, the Ten Commandments were just ten words. That, in fact, that's what the Jews called them, the Ten Words. But the Old Covenant was a massive law, was it not? And those Ten Commandments just represented the totality of the law of Moses. And those Ten Commandments were referred to as the testimony. So what did John do? He looked into the temple of the tabernacle of the what? Of the testimony. Folks, if there were anything that was of vital importance in that ark, it was what? The law of God. Okay? The law of the Almighty God. This temple resides in the heavenly realm. It is not the temple of the Jews located in the city of Jerusalem. That temple had served its purpose, had it not? Now God was about to bring the temple down and not one stone would be left standing on another. Matthew 24, verse 2. Verse 6 of Revelation 15. And seven angels came out of the what? Out of the temple. We've almost forgot about them. Haven't we? Okay. They were, they were introduced in verse 1, and then we went through four verses, five verses, nothing, and then all of a sudden, here they are again. And seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues. Remember, before they were sent forth, what did God do to the redeemed? He made them secure, did He not? He brought them around His throne for His protection. I, I just I, that, that picture just gives me chills. Now the angels come forth from the temple on a mission from who? From the Almighty God. Folks, where did they come out of? They came out of the temple. Where was the temple? It was the most holy place in the tabernacle. It's the dwelling place of God. It was God who had sent these angels on their mission. Man. I got to thinking about these guys. These angels. Okay? We all know that angels are blanks of God. We always say that. And we need to get that word messengers out of our head. Okay? They, they are that... Okay, but folks, that, that's, not, that's not all they do is, is take a message. These guys aren't bringing a message to anybody. Okay? Ministers. Ministers. Folks, they are servants. They are slaves of the Almighty God. A slave, what's his job? To do his master's will. That's what these angels are for. I wrote this statement down. When angels are moving, 
They are always fulfilling the divine will of God. Folks, you never want to see an angel on the move. You know what? If you see an angel, you better hope that angel is just sitting there. Okay? And sometimes, even if he's sitting there, that's when he has a what? That's when he's got a message. <laughs> Remember him sitting, those two angels sitting in Jesus' tomb? Okay? But if they're moving, guys, they're on a mission from Jehovah. These angels are ministers of God. And they're out here doing His bidding. And these angels are about to do that. But now notice how they're clothed. They're clothed in what? Ah, yes. They're clothed in pure and white linen. Linen. Listen to this statement. Matthew 28, beginning of verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning in his raiment, white as snow. Those angels dress in pure white. What, what's, what's the picture? It's not like angels really have robes, you know. Clorox would love angels. and you know, they, they, They'd have a good, good business up in heaven if they were really wearing robes, right? Uh, what, what is he talking about? They're, they're dressed in linen that's pure and white. What, what is this? Spotless, purity. Yeah, folks, these angels are angels of who? Angels of God. And there is not a taint of sin on them. They are pure, and they are holy, and they are righteous, and they are godly. And they are so pure, and so holy, and righteous, that when you see them, guess what they do? They shine. They shine. I've seen some fun people to be around, but I ain't never seen anybody shine. Okay? See them sunburned. Okay, that's just not the same, is it? Just not the same. Turn over to Revelation 19. Somebody read verse 8. Hear that? Now notice what the text says. And to her was granted. The question that we ought to ask is what? Who is the? Who is her? You know, that's not great English, is it? Who is her? Who is this person? Folks, in the context, it's the bride of Christ. It's the church. It's guess who? It's us. When you and I get into the heavenly realm, when you and I have been victorious, over all of our enemies, over Satan himself, guess what we get to wear? The same clothing as angels do. Linen. Clean and what? Clean and white. Notice how he describes it, which is the what? The righteousness of the saints. Folks, where did you get that righteousness? Did you do it all by yourself? No, you didn't do it all by yourself. You aren't righteous. I'm not good enough so that I can get to heaven and shine on my own light. Oh no. I bear the righteousness of Christ, don't I? Found in the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm wearing. And it's that garment that causes me to what? Shine in all my brilliance in the hereafter. Because you see there, I will no longer... Have my light dimmed at all by sin or temptation, will I? Man, what a picture. But now notice what else they're wearing. And having their breast girded with what? Golden girdles. Now when we think about girdles, we always think about women, don't we? Tightening them things up, you know, making them look skinny when they're not. You know, all that stuff. Um... <laughs> Folks, girdles in the first century and in Old Testament times were more like what? Belts. 
Okay, big broad sashes. Okay, and what they did was they tied the upper part of an outfit or armor to the what? To the bottom part of that outfit. Okay, and there were two main groups of people who wore girdles. One were the priests. Okay. They had upper garments and they had lower garments, right? And guess what tied those together? A girdle, okay? And that girdle was also there to provide strength to the body, okay? You have something around your waist and you tie that good and tight and it's pretty wide. Does that help you when you're having to stoop and pick up and do things? Yeah, at the gym you see people all the time. These guys are going to lift heavy weights. Guess what they got on? Big old belt, man. Okay, that's their girdle, isn't it? To, to give them even more strength and ability. Um, who was the second group of individuals who wore girdles? Yes, yeah, soldiers. Okay, they had the bottom part of their armor, they had the top part of their armor, and then they were girded about the waist with a girdle. Turn over to Ephesians 6. Somebody read verse 14. Fourteen. Stand therefore as having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Ah, stand there having what? <coughs> having your waist girded about with what? With truth. Folks, you and I are soldiers in the Lord's army. And guess what we have wrapped about our waist? Truth. The truth of God's holy and divine word. Let me ask you this. Does truth make you strong? Yes. You see, you wrap, that, you wrap that girdle around your waist and you go out into the world and guess what? You're able to stand against the enemy. Okay? Because you have the strength of God's word tied about you. And we are soldiers in what? In the Lord's army, are we not? Now notice, there's two things about this, these girdles. We've already mentioned one. A girdle indicates... Strength, okay? But notice these are what? Golden girdles. Folks, when an individual saw somebody wearing a girdle, they immediately knew, here's a person with some type of a position, okay? Position of importance. Let me ask you, well, go back to Revelation 1 for just a minute. Somebody read verse 13. I girded about the chest with a what? A golden band, her says. King James says, a golden girdle. Folks, that's the picture of Jesus, okay, in all of his glory and all of his splendor, standing in the heavens. And guess what he has wrapped about him? A golden girdle. Now we've got seven angels who come forth from the temple of God. And what are they wearing? Golden girdles, just like their who? Just like their commander. Man. Folks, these guys are on a what? They're on a mission. You know? Does it feel good to be able to dress like your general? Oh man, that makes you feel good, don't you? You know? You're ready. Look at me. And everybody knows. Man, he looks just like his who? He looks just like his commander. He looks just like his Lord. Folks, these guys are the Lord's servants. They're on his side. And they're fighting on his behalf. What a beautiful picture it is. So strength and position are in those golden girdles. Now note this. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven gold vials full of the wrath of God. One of the four angels. I mean, one of the four beasts have we read about these four beasts in the Revelation before? Oh yes, we've read about them. Okay, And we've read about them way, 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 way back there. Okay, Does anybody know what the four beasts are? 
Don't go looking, cheaters. See, y'all are trying to look it up. You got your reference. You're going back, and I'm going to show them how smart I am. Okay? Nobody remembers? Aren't you glad you don't? Because you don't have to. Because we don't know which one gave the vials to these seven angels. It just says what? Word of the beast. I don't know which one it was. Okay? You can go back and look them up in Revelation chapter 4, 7 and 8. Notice they were given what? Golden vials. Wow, golden vials. Well, let's go back for just a minute. These beasts, we talked about them earlier. What do they represent? The Bible says that these four beasts dwell where? Does anybody remember? No. In the midst of the throne of God. Okay, In chapter 4, we're given a description of the throne room of God. And the four beasts dwell in the midst of the throne. Does anybody know what they represent? Do you remember? Nobody. Folks, they represent the nature of the Almighty God. Okay? They represent the nature of deity. So, um, you know, they're, they're right there in the throne. And so, these four pictures, take for instance, one of them was a calf. Okay? And oxen and stuff were thought to be what? Strong. Powerful creatures, right? One of them had the face of a man. Folks, is God, or does God, I know we need to change this, but I'm going to say it this way. Does God have attributes that we have? Yes. Really, we have attributes that God has because He gave us His attributes, right? We have a mind. We have the ability to reason, to think. To, we have emotions, just like God does. So there's a sense in which God is what? Likened to a man to some extent. Okay? So the, these four beasts represent the nature of the Almighty God. And now one of these beasts, remember he's around the throne of God, right? Where are these angels coming out of? The temple of God, where the throne of God dwells. And one of them gives these seven angels seven vials. V-I-A-L-S. What's a vial? What is it? A little container. A little bit bigger than our communion cups out there. Okay. Folks, the real word is bowls. Okay. Saucers. They're large, flat bowls. Usually can be held in two hands. Probably weren't, but you know, a couple of inches deep. And notice the text says that these bowls are what? Full of what? The wrath of God. Full of the wrath of God. Folks, there's no partiality in God's wrath on this occasion. They're not part full. They're not half full. They're full of the wrath of the Almighty God. Okay? Man. I thought we were going to finish. And I hate that. We will start right there next week. Next week. And we'll also get into chapter 16. So go ahead and read it. Guys, in chapter 16, guess what's there? The pouring out of all seven bowls. Okay, every one of them are poured out in one chapter. Okay, so we'll read about those next week. Thank you, thank you.